poker, poker raised me, you know? We're joined now by author, speaker, entrepreneur, and former poker host to the rich and famous. Her book, Molly's Game, is the inspiration for the Aaron Sorkin-directed, Oscar-nominated movie of the same name. She is, of course, Molly Bloom. Molly, welcome to The Chip Race. Thank you very much. Well, I have to start with your name. Darren and I are both big fans of Joyce okay. and Ulysses, of course. Uh, were your parents aware of uh, the literary reference when they named you? They were aware, but it was not the, uh, the reason. Okay. I was named after my grandmother. Oh. Well, congratulations on both the book and the Thank movie. You. Um, I'm very interested in the arc of your career uh, because, like myself, you've done a number of different things. You were, you were on course to be an Olympic skier, you ran the biggest poker game in the world, and now you're an entrepreneur and writer. Do you think there's a consistent quality that you possess that draws you to these different careers? I, I don't know if there's a, a quality that draws me to these careers, but I think what um, the, the sort of common thread is that I just kind of refuse to give up. <laughs> I just got that don't quit kind of thing, you know? Well, in April 2013, I'm sure a date you remember well, uh, you were arrested and prosecuted by New York's D District Attorney Preet Bharara, uh, who poker players know very well yeah. um, as the DA who enforced the UIGEA uh, mm -hmm. against poker stars Full Tilt and Ultimate Belt, we call it Black Friday. Um, I wanted to know what your opinion was on the let's call it nanny policies of the US with regard to poker. I don't know so much if it's my business what, what the policies are. Um, you know, it, so much goes into it that I'm not aware of. Uh, I thought that 10 years for running a, a game of Texas Hold'em sounded excessive, but you know, I, I knew the law and I broke it and that's that. Uh, you managed to get your book published in 2014. How long was it before Hollywood came knocking? I knocked on Hollywood. <laughs> um, I really believed that I, I was in this situation where I was broke, I was a convicted felon, and um, the tabloids had told my story. And I believed that the only way out of it, or w the best way out of it, was to take back control of the narrative and to, and to tell the story. And so, um, you know, I got a modest book, book deal and realized that I needed a little bit more firepower. So um, I started looking at the necessary ingredients to make a, a successful movie. And I really believed that content and writing was huge. And so then I started looking at writers. Um, and I am a huge fan of Aaron Sorkin, but also uh, coming from a gambling background, I like the numbers on him. I like uh, <laughs> that he delivers box office hits, that he uh, delivers award nominations. And if you look at his stats, he's... Uh, his, his, ba his batting average is pretty good. I love how you started the answer to that question, like she's the one who knocks. Um, <laughs> but uh, even though, uh, speaking of Aaron Sorkin, even though you're putting your life story in the hands of someone of that caliber, of course, were you ever worried that the script and, and then of course the movie he ended up directing would misrepresent you in any way? I felt pretty confident that I could uh, play a part in that because you know, in the past, Aaron's written movies about Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. Clearly, there's a lot in the public medium telling their story. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately for him, I was the only <laughs> source material <laughs> that he had. And getting to know Aaron, I really believed that the story he wanted to tell was um, w was doing was honoring uh, my story. And so I, I got really comfortable with it um, throughout the process. In the movie, you were played by the brilliant Jessica Chastain. Yes. Um, were there any qualities of yours that you, f that you felt she really nailed? Or, and was there anything additional that you felt that wasn't quite you that you brought to the role? Oh, I think Jessica makes me look better than, <laughs> than I make me. Um, I, but, you know, I always say to, to Jessica and Aaron, I'm like, great. Now everyone thinks that I'm supposed to sound like Sorkin and look like Jessica. You know, like <laughs> it's not a tall order at all. Yeah. Um, I, I loved Jessica's portrayal of, of the character. I think she showed uh, simultaneous vulnerability and strength, which is not an easy sort of uh, place to, to come from. And, um, I, I, you know, I think she gave a flawless performance and um, I'm super grateful to her that she took on the role. I've seen what's on those hard drives. Families, lives, careers will be ruined. Why are you in this alone? Where are the people you're protecting by not telling the whole story? 
I tell them everything they want to know about me. About me. That's it. Well, speaking of performances, your father was played by the great Kevin Costner. Yes. Uh, I think it's fair to say that he is portrayed as a pushy parent mm -hmm. uh, who did put a lot of pressure on you, particularly maybe in your youth. Was this very true to your own life? And was that big scene at the end where you talk on the park bench, was that something that really happened? My father was very hard on me. Um, he was even harder on me than he was on my brothers. And I got in a similar conversation to the park bench. It, it happened. Uh, but it happened in Malibu. Um, I, got to under, I got to realize why. He said, Molly, I have been a psychologist uh, for 40 years, and I know that the world's a really hard place, and I know it's particularly hard for women. And he said, I wanted to make you formidable. And as a young child, I always believed that he was harder on me because he didn't like me or because he didn't think I was good enough. And so, you know, moments like this, I think, are some of the the beautiful things that come with age, right? You get perspective. And I got to realize that my dad was a young man when he was raising me. He was, you know, he was my age. And maybe he, his delivery wasn't always so perfect, but he came from a place of, of love. And, you know, since that conversation, um, my dad and I have grown very, very close. And I would say that he is definitely my biggest fan. And I'm probably his favorite kid now because... <laughs> Because I'm the one that got Kevin Costner to play him in a movie. <laughs> like all my brothers for all their accomplishments, Harvard this, Olympics that. They never got Kevin Costner to play him in a movie. So I think probably I'm the favorite now, finally. Yeah. <laughs> well, Michael Sarah played what I assume was a composite of different celebrities who played in, in your game. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as portrayed by Michael, it seemed to very much uh, mimic the mannerisms of Tobey Maguire in particular. Did you feel that the portrayal in the movie was a fair reflection of um, how, how he treated you? Aaron wrote a composite character. Um, so I don't think that I can really speak on whether or not that character act accurately portrayed it because that was Aaron's take. I, I wrote uh, about, about Toby in the book and um, that is a very accurate portrayal. I actually read an interview just the other day with Aaron Sorkin, I guess it was from when the movie came out, in which he was very clear about one thing, and that was that he hates poker and finds it totally unappealing as a sort of a visual medium, which I guess makes sense, you know, it's not, it's not the most exciting game. As a screenwriter, he, I, yeah. Correct, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually written a couple of scripts myself about poker, and uh, yeah, those scenes are just very hard to make work mm -hmm. dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, did he admit that to you at the outset, and did he get any particular help from maybe you or maybe another poker player? Uh, when devising those scenes? Yeah, I called um, some, uh, some of the players from the game, one in particular who was um, a, a, about as proficient and brilliant at poker and understanding the game as it gets. And, uh, and, he, and he helped Aaron a lot. And he had poker consultants on the set. You know, the great thing about Aaron is he, he understands like the necessary ingredients and then he puts it together. Like he knew that the chips had to make the right noise, you know, mm -hmm. and had to have the right weight. Like he got that, um, which is something that's so incredibly important. I think that, the, you know, what it sounds like when you walk into a room, it's really important. Um, and so he put all the right people on that. And, and, you know, that was one of the reasons that Aaron wanted to direct and became a first time director is because he said this movie more than any other movie that he's written, he knew what it was supposed to look like. Poker draws an eclectic mix of uh, participants and personalities, um, as it seemed to in your game as well. What do you think it is about poker that attracts people from all these different walks of life? Well, I, I know this as somebody who traveled the world to recruit poker players. Um, there's no common denominator that lives in socioeconomic status, culture, uh, gender. It's this, this X factor, this person that likes to play. Mm -hmm. and so. That's the only similarity sometimes you see at a table, um, which makes it a very interesting game to observe. It's, it's certainly fair to say that as a game runner, you put yourself in a pretty dicey, at times dangerous situation, certainly uh, as it seemed in the movie, uh, some scary scenes in there. Sure. Uh, I am reminded here of uh, your skiing background. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, do you think you got hooked maybe on the danger just a little bit, uh, that there was maybe a thrill-seeking component to it all? Uh, absolutely, I think that's a very perceptive uh, observation. Um, I'm an adrenaline junkie, mm. you know? I, I, I like risk, and maybe that comes from having a dad who, from the time I was little, taught me that um, 
fears were there for you to conquer and feeling that empowered feeling when you're so scared of something and you walk through that fear and you feel on the other side and all of a sudden uh, the limits of your world are expanded. You know, it's, it's a really incredible feeling and I think I, I, think I grew uh, almost addicted to that feeling, you know? Um, and it, you know, watching the movie, I'm just like, what was I thinking? But I have that in me, you know, to like look at something that I'm scared of and just walk right into it. Um, so, and I, and I do think that that comes from the sports background. There's a new offer on the table. Complete immunity. We hand over the hard drives. You've seen what's on those hard drives. A key plot point in the, in, in the film, and which didn't seem to be fictionalized at all, was that when, when the chips were down, so to speak, and it would have really benefited you to cooperate with the with the investigators and authorities you chose not to mm -hmm. uh, could you talk us through that decision sure I felt like I could survive jail I felt like I could make money again but I felt like making the decision to stand on other people um, and and potentially ruin their lives their wives lives their kids lives innocent bystanders yeah. was something that I could never uh, correct you know that felt like a life sentence the other stuff I, I believed in my ability to, to navigate that. As I'm sure you know better than most, a lot of poker players feel hard done by when they take a bad beat. Um, our former guest, Tommy Angelo, describes one of the responses to this as entitlement tilt. Um, ah, I love that. Yeah, um, that the player sort of goes on and plays recklessly after taking the bad beat because he feels that the cosmos owes him something. Uh, in a sense, your story begins with a bad beat, your skiing accident. Uh, do you feel like the choices you made afterwards could be viewed through that lens? Absolutely. Yeah. God, now I have like this whole different perspective on my whole life. What's this guy's name that identified that? <laughs> tell, me, tell me Angelo. He's a, I guess, psychologist in, in the world of poker. He's, yeah. He spent a lot of time on, yeah, the, on the mindset that side of the game. Very interesting. Totally. I was on tilt. For sure. Was it entitlement tilt, though, I suppose, specifically? Was it, was it a tilt that made you feel like, well, I deserved something. I worked really hard for something. I didn't get it. And now the world owes me something. So I'm going to take it. Mm, I don't know if it if it's necessarily the world owes me something, but um, I I want a significant life and I'm going to take it. You know, mm. and it, maybe it, I guess it's not at the Olympics, but I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up the time I have here on Earth. I'm not going to just like sit on the bench, right? I wanted a significant life. That's a great answer. For better or worse, the the the, the time described in the book and, and in the movie was obviously a very exciting time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you miss about that period when you were um, hosting the games and have you kept in contact with any of the players? I haven't really kept in contact with any of the players and sure I miss it, you know? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, it was, I, I, I was living outside of the rules of the world. I uh, had, didn't need to look at price tags when I went into stores. I got to be part of this like, you know, this, this incredibly exciting event every night it was mine. Mm. <laughs> Um, and it took me a long time to recover from, you know, the loss. The loss. Yeah. Well, finally, Molly, we are here at the Unibet Open Bucharest, uh, where you will be hosting uh, the Queen's Rules Ladies event. Um, have you completed all your background checks on the participants? Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to warn you here, there is one shady character. She goes by the code name Baltic Blonde. I do feel you need to keep tabs on her. She's going to be probably, I'm probably going to be her best friend. <laughs> <laughs> but on a serious note, though, could you speak a little about, you know, your role here and, and mm -hmm. what Queen Rules means? Yeah, well, well, you know, a lot of times I, um, I say no to poker uh, related um, events, and that's out of respect for um, the government, truly, you know, like I and and also basically like th in in the spirit of a fresh start. But when they described Queen's Rules to me, um, I couldn't say no. I really love it. I love it as a concept. I, lo I think it's clever. I think it's meaningful. And I wanted to be part of this event. Well, Molly, it's been a delight to chat to you today. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay here in Bucharest. And thank you so much for coming on the chip yeah. race. Thanks.